Praise the Lord. There he was. He's there at your darkest time. He's there at your best time. He's there at the easy times and the hard times. He's always God. He's always good. And uh, even when technical difficulties arise, the words are still good. The song is still well sung and the message is still gotten across. The devil tries to get into circuits and the electronics and stuff, but he's no match for the word of God and for his will. Amen. And Amen. So it's proclaimed and we're going to preach now. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy this. The title of the message today is called True Greatness. True Greatness. We'll be out of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. chapter 9, starting in verse 46. And there's a few times during the Gospels that the disciples were, of all things, worried about who was going to be the greatest. Uh, there was 12 of them, and of course, like, you get any group of guys together, and they're going to start... Uh, bickering and arguing and challenging and wondering of who's the best and there's just some kind of a drive I, I certainly speaking as a man of wanting to compete uh, i'm at the point now where i can't even really golf with my dad or my brother without it having to be some kind of an unnecessary competition it's like all right well let's see who's got you know and uh, they'll remind you of the score after every hole and like well it looks like you're down two now or something like <laughs> you guys my dad's retired and my brother uh you know he got his shift change in general motors which is great for him and uh, let's just say they have multiple days where they can go out and hit the links this was my fourth outing uh, for the year, and uh, so I'm not what you'd call mid-season form yet by any means, and, but they, um, they don't care. They said, if you're going to take the course, then you are in for the beating. So uh, trying to make a late comeback didn't work, but there's a thing about competition uh, and always wanting to be the greatest and the best. And to a degree, that's not a bad thing. I think pushing yourself to be the best that you can be in anything you do in life is a good thing. I don't think we should ever be complacent, and in most places in our life, certainly our faith. We should always be hungry to get closer to God. I think we should get hungry to be a better servant to one another. I, should, I think we should uh, learn how to love better, uh, certainly one another. All these things, and we can always push ourselves because we do want to be the best that we can be, but not for our own accolades, not to uh, present ourselves as something, because we are nothing. If our best is a filthy rag, then let's just keep it at that. But we want to glorify how good God is. Right? We want people to see Christ in us. That's what being a Christian is all about, is being Christ-like. But here are the fellows, you know, the 12 disciples, and they're, they're perceiving among themselves, it says in verse 46, it says, Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. And it says, Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him. Now, so Jesus sees into the, the thoughts and the hearts of men. And we've been talking about that on Thursday night with Jesus uh, being seen by John uh, with uh, eyes that are flame of fire, which are a sign of the purity of Christ's uh, uh, sight and that he can uh, see right through everything. You can't trip God. You can't hide behind God or hide anything from God. He sees everything in its purest form as it is meant to be seen. You can't trip God. So he knew what they were reasoning about. He could see right into what they were thinking, what they were feeling. And uh, it says in verse 48, after he brought the child before him, he says, uh, and said unto them, <clears throat> excuse me, whosoever shall receive this child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Now let's stop there for a second. Uh, and may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Matter of fact, let's just pray over the scriptures before we continue. We want God's hand all over this. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the special. Thank you, Lord, for the hymns. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship, Lord, but most of all, we're thankful for you, and we're thankful for your son, Jesus, who you sent to die on the cross for us and shed his precious blood that our sins may be washed away. But Heavenly Father, we pray today that you'd be with the preaching, Lord, that you'd certainly empty me of myself, fill me with your Holy Spirit, guide me, Lord, to rightly divide your word, and open our hearts, Lord, and our minds to the truth of your word, that we would be challenged today, Lord, that we would be convicted, that we would be taught that we'd be given what we need, Lord, to get closer to you and live biblically. I pray, Lord, for that one soul that might be here today that's not saved, or they're just not sure. Lord, I pray that they could walk out of the doors today, being absolutely sure of their eternity. Just have your way with the service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It says uh, in verse 48, when Jesus, after he had taken the 
uh, the child and, and set it before them. You know, he, uh, in, in the gospel accounts, he several times will take a child and set it before them and use them as the example of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And you think that's very interesting because a child is not a theologian. Uh, a child is not uh, in the middle of the greatest Bible college in the land and has all the facts and everything in their mind and can quote every single scripture at the drop of a hat. Although they were trained certainly in the Word of God, certainly in the Old Testament, the Torah, they knew it from a young age. They were taught throughout their uh, their youth. However, he uses them as a child in general and, and says, "Whoever receives that child also receives me, and whoever receives Christ receives the Father." But it starts by receiving the child. No man is going to look at a child and say, oh, this child is the greatest person walking the face of the earth. That kid can't lift as much as me. That kid can't preach like me. That kid, kid can't do this, can't do that. That's just a kid. But nevertheless, that's what Jesus uses as an example of who would be great. Why? Because in our eyes as adults, children are the least. Because they're smallest, they're youngest, they don't know what we know. All these different things. And Jesus is saying, that's the point. Because in the kingdom of heaven, this little child will be greatest because that who is least here will be greatest there. The apostles are thinking to themselves, well, we've got to do many wonderful great works in order to be the greatest. Who's going to sit on, the, on, uh, on Christ's right hand? Who, who's going to sit next to him? That's what uh, James and John, their mother, wanted us know. Will my sons be sitting there? You're asking for quite a bit there to be one to sit next to Christ. And, uh, of course, they end up getting the nickname the Sons of Thunder. But... Uh, what we think is true greatness is not what God thinks is true and says what true greatness is. It isn't about how many works you can do. It isn't about what you, you know, how busy you are in the church. It isn't about how many tracts you hand out. It isn't about how much scripture you can memorize, but rather, is, are you willing to be humble and submit before God to put everybody and everything first before you and, and, and to put Christ before you and take the back seat and let all things work as God would allow them? Uh, one thing that we you know, try and teach the kids, because it's something that my parents taught me, especially at a church dinner, with being Baptist, we are no strangers to. Uh, we have dinners, and we try and be respectful for those who are our seasoned saints to get a chance to get down the steps first and not be stampeded or anything like that. Give them their time, and they get first dibs, uh, you know, for the food. And they're very gracious at leaving plenty for the rest of us. We've yet to run out after our seasoned saints get down there first. Thank you for that. Probably because they're polite and humble and understand. But we certainly tell our kids, like, hey, you guys can wait. We'll go last. You sit, you wait, you'll get fed. Don't worry about it. If we run out, we'll get you something. But we want to make sure that everybody else gets a chance to eat and do that first. Because that's the point. We want to be servants to people. As Christians, it should be our goal and our mission, and among other things, is to be able to serve one another. Not, oh, i got to get first in line. There's pot roast down there. There's fried chicken. Yeah, I know, I can smell it. And, and I, I try, uh, you know, not to uh, use my nose too much on uh, dinner days because I don't want to be tempted out of cutting the preaching short. And I know you don't want that either. You're saying, preach on, preacher. We got crock pots plugged in. That's not happened, actually. But uh, <laughs> it probably never will. But that's the temptation of flesh. We will get into it. Uh, we talk about greatness. You think about greatness, all right? In your mind, you have what greatness is. If you like sports, you probably have, you know, the greatest team you've ever seen. You know, the greatest player you've ever seen. If you like, uh, you know, you look at companies, that this is the greatest company there ever was. They, they created this, these inventions. That was the greatest things in sliced bread. You know, has there ever really been a better thing than sliced bread? I don't know. It's a pretty good invention. Who would have thought? What's the greatest, greatest food? If I were to say, what's the greatest way to have a steak? You'd get rare, medium rare, medium uh, hopefully not a well done, but if so, I, I'm guessing you're an A1 fan too. I don't know how you can eat a well done steak. But you all have in your minds what is the greatest and what greatness is. And just like the Lord and how he does it is he takes what we think we know is greatness and he shows us a greatness we would have never considered. See, humility is far beyond us and what we would naturally consider. Humility is something that comes along as a discipline that we get from reading the Word of God. It's something we have to remember to do. And it is something that the Lord certainly helps us with, but there are certainly more humble Christians than others. There are ones that are willing to have humility. There are ones that are, are, are more than willing to put others well before themselves, before they even think about what they need or what they want. And you think about Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who came to the earth as a servant, as the Lamb of God, to be the sacrifice for our sins, and how much he did for other people. When he's the King of kings, we all should have, should have been at his feet when he was walking this earth. Everybody should have made sure he should have never had to work on this, or walk on this little filthy ground. 
But he went out there seeking to serve and set an example for you and I. He washed the uh, disciples' feet, didn't he? Well, they did the Lord's Supper. He washed their feet. And what did Peter say? Oh, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, Peter, if you won't let me wash your feet, then you can have no part of me. You've missed everything what I've come down here to teach you and show you. And he said, well, then not my feet only, Lord, but also my head, my toe, all the way down, head to toe, right? Cleaning it all up. But he said he didn't have need of that because he was already in belief and he was already cleansed from the blood of Christ. And certainly in salvation. Uh, I've heard many times when it talks about, you know, look, I've been to churches that do feet, uh, feet washings. And I, I should say it right, feet washings. <laughs> it tends to be a little bit more subtle. And I've heard people say, I will never wash somebody else's feet. That's disgusting. But Jesus did it. Now, what will you say to that? Now, it wasn't an ordinance given. Like, you know, uh, when Margie gave her testimony for membership last week, and she talked about, and she rightly, biblically said, the two ordinances given to the church were baptism by full immersion and by administering the Lord's Supper. Those are the two ordinances that were given to the church to do. Foot washing was not one of them. But church dinners weren't one of them either. We do that. Everybody likes a dinner. People like to do outings. We like to do a lot of different things. But you think about the humility of foot washing. Uh, yeah, it's not something anybody would say, oh, I'm first in line for that one. Yeah, I want to get, let me get at everyone's feet. No, people usually don't say that. But the example of humility is right in our very face. Using a child, you ever been shown up by somebody? Maybe somebody who was younger and things, you thought you, thought you could do it, and then somebody comes along and just shows you up. Uh, imagine being there as the apostles and the miracles you've already seen and the things the Lord has allowed you to take part in. Uh, just miraculous things that people couldn't do, certainly without God. But he says, oh, you want to be the greatest? And he's like, hey, send that kid up here. Here you go. This is how you be great. Imagine the head scratcher that would have been for these guys. You called us, Lord. We're, hey, we're your apostles. You've used us to do this and to do that. All these many mighty works. You're telling me that a kid is greater than us? Yes. Now, I want you to see this next part, because uh, the Scripture changes gears real quick, thanks to John. Uh, look at verse 49. Jesus had just said this. Now, listen, I know sometimes in Scripture, it's like there's some time that passes. You just, you're, you're in another period of time. A week passes, a day, whatever it may be. The very next ber verse, which shows no passage of time, and Jesus just teaches them this. It says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Let's look at a couple things here with that, because number one, you'd think after Jesus gave you something like this, you'd chew on it for a little bit. How can this be? What is the Lord trying to teach me here, having a child up here and saying, this is the greatest? This doesn't really make a lot of sense. I need to process this. And you should. That doesn't make a lot of logical sense to me. Instead, John jumps. He, he just like, let's just change the subject here. Let's jump into this. And he says, what about this guy we saw casting out devils in my name? And we forbade him. Probably thinking he was going to get, you know, a pat on the back from the Lord. Like, oh, now that's what I'm talking about. Now that's great. You stopped this guy because he wasn't with us. Is that we told him, he, he didn't follow with us. Jesus, again, he just turns it around on him, doesn't he? Excuse me, he says, Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. Oh, how Christians could benefit from Jesus' words right there. You know, um, this morning I, I dropped uh, Nikki off at the church uh, so she could come in and, and start you know, her process. And uh, my uh, low fuel light came on just as I pulled in. I said, I'm just going to run down into Orwell. I'm going to get some gas real quick, and I'll be right back. So I went down to Orwell, and there's a little shell station there at the corner of 322 and 45. And uh, on my way down, you'll pass right in the heart of Orwell. There's a Presbyterian church and a Catholic church, to which both uh, parking lots were full. And I never really thought to look at it because, quite frankly, I'm usually in here when it's church time, and I don't go down that way until after church if I'm trying to get me some A&W or some Mexican. It's the two choices you have in this town to eat if you want to eat out, and, which are good, by the way. I'm not complaining. But I thought to myself, I said, Lord, there are people that still have a hunger to some degree that want to be in your house. Yeah. And, you know, this isn't a Presbyterian church. It's not a Catholic church. You know, this is a, this is a Baptist church. My prayer is that the people got the word of God unadulterated this morning. They got the truth. That's Amen. all I can really hope for. There are people still going. There are people looking for answers. Now, if they're preaching the biblical gospel, then forbid them not. Let them be and let them bring people to Christ. If they're for Christ, they're not against him. But when you start messing with what the Bible says and telling people other ways to get to heaven, then we've got a problem. 
That's not what this guy did. Now, by the way, John asks that, no doubt, because in his mind, he's, I'm sure he didn't accept what Jesus said about the kid. He said, well, here's a guy that we thought he was a false uh, convert, a false believer. He's out here. Who does he think he is? He's not walking with us, 12, 13, if you count Jesus, of course. Uh, and he's out here casting people on his name. Who, what right does he have? Well, we shut him down for you, Lord. Isn't that great? Well, how, you know, how hard that would have been for us to just step in and cut that guy down. But we did it because he's not with us. Where Jesus, no, no, no. See, he is with us because he's not against us. Leave him alone. Let him be. Let him do his thing. See, sometimes I think we get so into the miracles of Jesus and what he teaches, we, we, we sometimes lose the humanity of the apostles. How would you feel if you stood up there, you were called by Christ to follow him and be part of his ministry, and you say, hey, that's the Son of God, man, we're following the Messiah. And then he's like, no, you've got to be like a kid. If, if you can receive a kid in his ways, the way he is, you can receive me. And when you can receive me, then you receive the Father. It, it can be mind-boggling. And to show you they still haven't gotten it yet, read on a little bit further. Verse 51 says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Let's stop there for a second. That'd be great, huh? You want to talk about two great, a true greatness? Imagine calling down fire because they wouldn't accept our Lord, so we're going to burn them all up. You think, what a thing. Look, we read throughout the Old Testament when God showed up and, pre and pronounced judgment on folks and fire did rain down and all these different things. And what a sight to behold to know that God is God in heaven and he does this. So they're thinking, we're really going to show the Lord how great we are because we know the scriptures. We know you can do that. We believe you can do that. We're going to call this down because you're with us. We have faith that through your power, these people can be absolutely burned up because they have rejected you and wouldn't let you in. Now, it's interesting, too, because when I look at the verse, what is it, 53? When it says, uh, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem, obviously he had in his mind he's going to Jerusalem. The, the fulfillment of time is coming upon him. But also remember that Jesus, in, in, in his earthly life, was a Jew. Also understand that he was talking about Samaria, going into uh, Samaria. The Samaritans did not like the Jews. So by taking one look at him, if his face was as if he would go to Jerusalem, that was the Jew city, so they can tell he's Jewish, they probably didn't want him there on that basis alone. Today we would call it racism. I'm sure you've all heard of it. But nevertheless, in verse 55, he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are. <clears throat> For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. They just moved on. You know how many people won't move on because of their pride, their grudges, their ego, and all those things? This is Jesus, the Son of God, who, if anybody could have killed them on the spot, could it not have been the Lord? He came to save them. He didn't come to kill them. See, John 3.17 tells us all about that, doesn't it? We know John 3.16, but John 3.17, hey, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. Now, Jesus is the judge, right? Jesus is the one who will sit, and he will judge. For us as Christians, and when we sit before him, or stand before him, actually fall on our faces before him, let's be more accurate, before the Bema seat, when we're in his holy presence, and we're going to have to give an account for what we did as Christians, and our works will be judged as Christians by a trial of fire, and it'll either burn up as wood, hay, and stubble, or it'll come through as, uh, as uh, gems and precious stones. There's also another judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, where Jesus will also be seated and will judge for those who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life and be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. But it won't be because he didn't give them an opportunity and show grace and mercy that they might be saved. He didn't hide his mercy from them. He didn't hide himself from them. Jesus is out there for anybody who wants to find him. And it's interesting to know, too, Jesus is not the one who's lost. People say, I found Jesus. He wasn't the one that was missing. Jesus found you. You, were, you went and, and you opened yourself up and you wanted to seek him and there he was. He came unto you. You knocked and he opened. Uh, ask and it will be given to you. Jesus is not one trying to play a spiritual hide and seek game with mankind. He wants you to 
Accept him. He wants you to know him. And he put, that's why he sends witnesses out there. That's why it's so vital that you and I are telling folks about him. Introduce him. Tell them about how good he is. But that's not what James and John wanted to do. They wanted to nuke these guys and get, and get them out. How dare they treat you like this, Lord? Some of the best testimonies I've heard in my life were people who absolutely hated God at one minute, were burned out on drugs, alcohol, and all that, until they came to themselves and they got saved, they got born again. And not only did they just get saved, which for many of us would say, isn't that just enough for someone like that? It's, it's any of us to get saved. Don't put the drug addict, don't put the alcoholic, don't put this person down here beneath you. We were all on our way to a devil's hell before we got saved by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ through faith. Yes, good. So don't look down at anybody else, but rather have compassion and grace and, and, and don't give up on prayer. Some people you may have to pray your whole life for before they finally get saved. Well, were you really upset that you wasted that air on those extra prayers or was it not worth it in the eternity segment? Keep praying. We can't save anybody anyways. Let's be honest about it. We, we want the Lord to. We're making a petition for people. We talked a little bit about that in Sunday school. In our prayer life, we must be doing more than just asking the Lord for stuff for us. Think about it. What could be greater than taking your enemies down by calling fire down from heaven? See, they were confused at what true greatness was. Jesus in his meekness and his love, and his mercy, his grace, that's true greatness. His humility, that's true greatness. Anything that goes against the way of the world, and the ways of sin, the ways of man, that's where you're going to find true greatness, because that's where you'll find godliness. And God, God's ways, God, his godliness, that is what greatness truly is. How in the world do you forgive somebody who hates you by every way that they live? Even for their very words, would use your name as a, as a cuss word and, and, and go out and live as if there is no God or there is no eternity and things. But God in his infinite mercy and, 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 uh, and his grace and his love that he shows towards mankind, he still loves us. Because you know why? He loved us before we loved him. Yeah. He loved us first. He loved you when you hated him. He loved you when you didn't think twice about him. He loved you when you weren't faithful to him. He loves you unconditionally. Because he died for the whole world's sake. That's why it's such a pity, it's such a heartbreaker that it's the way it is so narrow. Straight, I'm fine with. It should be a straight game. But narrow is sad. You know, in, in, in hunting, you typically want to find the game trail that's a little bit more wide and a little bit more trod down. Because especially if you are limited on your hunting time, you want somewhere where you're pretty sure something's going to show up if you shoot. You don't want the one with barely you know, a few blades of grass bent down. and like, okay, something's been here, but this isn't a high route of traffic. You want to go somewhere where you give yourself, it's a broader way. It's like, okay, this is, where, this is where the travel's at. But that's not the way it is getting into heaven. That's why we don't follow man. That's why we don't follow what everybody else is doing in the newest trend. And oh my goodness, the trends are everywhere in the church and things like that. Folks, you'd be better off just stick to the Bible. Amen. Just stick to the Word of God and seek His face. And when I say seek his face, I think of Daniel. Daniel, I believe it was chapter 6 in Daniel where the other presidents, they call they, they were getting mad about Daniel because he still served his God. So what they go and run and tell, uh, was it King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, if I'm getting my Babylonian kings right, uh, and uh, gets him to you know, sign the decree. Anybody who gives any kind of oblation or, or, or uh, respect to another god that's not me, they'll be thrown in the lion's den. Daniel was in there in that meeting. He held rank in the Babylonian government. What did he do? He immediately went home. He, he put his face towards Jerusalem, opened his window. He didn't hide. And he just knelt down. He prayed three times a day. Did he do it to make a political statement? Did he do it so people would be like, oh man, I'll be an influencer here. Everybody's going to look at me and think I'm so awesome. And He did it because he was truly seeking his living God's face and, and seeking his counsel and praying to him because God was more important to him than his earthly life. It was more important to him than a Babylonian kingdom. It was more important to him what other people would think. He's going to seek the living God and, and find his wisdom. No matter what it, the world says or what anybody else says, I'm going to do what's right. i got to speak to my God. He made, and he made three times a day. How many of us at times where we just get so busy, the best prayer we can say is, Lord, thanks for this food, amen. And we just go on about our day. Oh, we 
probably just about all been there. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but fortunately for you, the camera's pointed this way, so no one would know at home. I think it's very honest when we're in the house of God and under the conviction of preaching that we are honest before God because this is a time where using his word, he begins to sift us and he begins to search us and know the, our reins and our hearts. And, he, and I'm thankful that we have a God that's merciful to show us our flaws, that we may repent of them and get right so we can get close. He's like, listen, we can't have the relationship that I want to have with you. Until you get this dealt with. So here's your problem. You need to repent and turn back to me. Let's walk close together again. When I take a walk with my wife, I, I don't tell her, like, hey, spread out. Go over there on the other side of the road, and I'll meet you when we get back at home. Let's have a nice romantic walk. That's not how we do it. Holding hands. Arm around shoulder. Or at least just stand real close and then just walking and talking together. Why? Because we have an intimate relationship where we can, we're close and we're talking and we crave that closeness one with another. Well, the Lord craves that closeness too, but the problem is when there's something between us, he can't have that relationship. He's holy. He's just. He can't overlook sin. It's up to you to realize where your sin's at because of his prompting, his revealing of it to you. You need to repent of it and get right along with it, which, by the way, takes humility. I, in a weird way, I've learned a lot from my sons. Five and two. And it takes a lot of training. As you, if anybody's ever parented or been around kids, you know they usually don't get it the first time and then, all right, we're good the rest of our lives. I told them no once and we're all set. It's a process, as they say. And, but I think about when they do something and you reprimand them or whatever and they're, they're punished for it and they'll come over and say, I'm sorry. You know, and then they get and they do what they're told to do, and, and they try and make it right. Why? Because ultimately, I'd like to believe my sons love me. <laughs> I hope so, you know, otherwise it's, it's pretty awkward around the house, but they'll come up and give me a hug and, or something like that. You know, and I, I try and take time with it. When I have to scold them or something else to punish them, I, I want to take time and say, do you understand why Dad had to do that? I love you. I don't want you to run around like a heathen. I don't want you to, you know, to be disobedient. You need to learn to pick up after yourself. You need to learn to say please and thank you and all that. And, and they're looking at you and saying, okay, yes, Dad, you know, or yes, Mom, whoever's talking to them. And you can, when you see them actively try and put that into practice, which, by the way, doesn't come naturally to say please and thank you because we're born into sin and iniquity. We're selfish by nature. It teaches me a little something about humility. But a kid realizing, you can see in their eyes when they realize they've done wrong. When, when dad gets mad and then all of a sudden their demeanor changes and he comes and says, oh no, you know. When we're in the presence of a holy God, folks, who isn't just patting us on the back just through whatever we want to do, and whether we're sinning or not. He's like, oh, we're good, don't worry about it. We're, we're, we're close, I love you. He does love you, but it doesn't mean that you always have that close fellowship when you've got sin in the way. Now, talking about greatness... Folks, the disciples really didn't want to sit and ruminate on what he said. Everything was about a show. Everything was about an outward display of power, of reprimand, of, of raining down fire. All these things that, let's be honest, the human race does absolutely would equate with greatness. They believed God was great enough to do that. They didn't argue that one bit. We can see it. We know you can do it, Lord. Let's see it. Let's go. Burn them up. How dare they speak to you and treat you that way? Where would we be if that was God's approach to everything? But it says, he says, no, no. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what I came to do. He wanted to save lives, not destroy them. Every one of us would have been deserving of destroy, or destruction. But his long-suffering and his mercy, some of you got saved a little bit later in life. You think about how merciful he was. Some of us got saved as children. Not all of us did. And you think about what he allowed you to live through and how he let you live. And he just continued to put air in your body and let you get up a day after day. Because he knew there was going to come a time where you were going to get another opportunity. There was a time where he was going to encounter you and you were going to be met with a choice. So I'm either going to accept this Lord who loves me so much and took my place on a cross. Or I'm going to reject him and go to hell. But he was gracious enough to give you that opportunity. And just on that, and, and I'll end with this, uh, this little story. I, I was at a revival meeting, and the preacher t uh, told a story about a lady that went to his church. She was saved for many years, very faithful to the church, but her husband didn't believe. And uh, she tried and tried, invited him to church, would witness to him, all these different things. 
And one night they were driving, uh, they were, might have been West Virginia or something like that. And if you've ever been there, you know some roads can get quite windy. And uh, they happened to turn on the radio and there was a preacher preaching on the radio. And he was driving, he turned it up and he was listening. And the whole time the wife said, I just kept praying, Lord, please reach him, let him get saved. It got down to the end of the message, and the preacher said on the radio, Now, if you're driving wherever you are, would you be willing to stop? Would you, would you accept Christ as your Savior? Would you get saved today? And she said her husband uh, just sat there for a minute, and he gritted his teeth. He said, I will not. And he turned the uh, radio off. They went around the corner just after he turned the radio off, flipped the truck, and he died right then and there. She survived. He died. And he's in hell today. And I say that because I say, look how gracious God was and is. He knew when he was going to call that man home, he gave him one last chance. All those years, he had a faithful wife, faithful to the Lord, no doubt faithful to him, and continually witnessed and gave and loved him and all those, and, and gave a clear presentation on the radio of the gospel. And to make the choice that I will not, and turn it off, and he sealed his fate. But God was merciful and just to give him the opportunity. See, if God never let him choose, or any, and, and really, even if he didn't have that opportunity, sounds like he had plenty before that. That's just how good God is. But he can't make the decision for you. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Be the least. Put yourself down here. Put God up here. Put everybody else in between and serve and love other people. The more you focus on loving other people, the better you'll be. Because it's a full-time job worrying about yourself. And you'll never be satisfied with yourself. But you can be satisfied in Christ. And you can be satisfied serving other people and putting them before you. And Jesus said, that's what true greatness is. Let's stand on our feet. We'll bow our heads in a word of prayer.